Ladies and gentlemen, I take great pleasure in introducing to you my husband, the dimpled, brilliant, assertive, with slightly less hair, man I fell in love with so many years ago, President Richard Garassi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please be seated. It's been a long and beautiful evening, uh, an evening that I certainly will cherish forever. And I'll cherish it because we're together here, all of us together across all these different domains that bring us together around Wagner College. And I, have a, I had a prepared speech, actually a fairly lengthy written speech, but I'm not going to do that because I think the movie, thank you very much. That's the illustrious district attorney of Staten Island, <laughs> who I will tell you a story. We had a, we had a fellow who uh, attempted to burglarize one of our residence halls, and he was arrested, and lo and behold, I followed the case, and lo and behold, they let him go on probation. So I called up Donovan, and I said, how can you let this guy get away with this? Well, the judge did this and this and this and this. So. Always. <laughs> a year later, the guy returned. Again, tried to burglarize uh, Harborview Hall. I call up Donovan and I say, Dan, either you put him in jail or I give him a master's degree because I want him off my campus. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. <laughs> We've accomplished a great deal together. It's obvious this great moment we've arrived at. But this wasn't about a president, this is about a community working together across all the different leadership quotients that we have at Wagner College from student leaders, alumni leaders, trustees, faculty, which are so critical to what we're doing at Wagner, parents, the community of Staten Island and its leadership. It's been a tremendous, tremendous convergence of interests and really good intentions together that have really brought us to this moment. We've achieved a great deal. Some of it you've heard tonight. Uh, we've created a, a really a fa fabulous learning model for students here, linking learning and location, linking ourselves to New York City, and uh, creating cohorts of students in these learning communities, clusters of students where they take multiple courses from disciplines that are themed together and do clinical based field work uh, in the community, either professional, pre-professional work or, or civic work. And that has been a model, as Carrie, uh, Carol Geary Schneider wrote about in her piece that I hadn't seen. I hadn't seen any of this tonight. I want you to know this is a total surprise in terms of speakers and the like. But we built that model together. The faculty was at the center of it. Students have been champions of it. We, kept, we helped this college achieve, for, for the first time in its history, significant financial stability. We did that together by growing the endowment, smart budgeting, very, very clever investing in terms of solid investing, good principles. We brought together a national student body from 44 states, 20 countries. They're just remarkable. We have more students from California than we have from the other four boroughs combined. 85% of our students live on campus for the last 10 years in a row in the first year, and about 70% overall. Uh, we brought together eight graduate programs and 350 graduates. The entering freshman class at Wagner this year, the students that just appeared on our campus this fall, no exceptions. Their composite high school grade point average was 90. So we've just brought this tremendous group of students together. And
And we've received great accolades for those who assess the learning programs here. We've had great learning outcomes. You know, colleges are assessed every 10 years, usually every five years, but certainly every 10 years, by one of the regional accreditors. Our regional accreditor is the Middle States Commission on Higher Education. I've been on a lot of these visiting teams. You prepare a two or three year study, then you're visited by a team of your peers that represent everybody from the finance officers to other faculty members and provosts and presidents and the like. There are 14 rigorous standards you have to accomplish, many of them like uh, very discernible, measurable learning outcomes, financial stability, planning, so on and so forth. And uh, we were visited a year and a half ago by the Middle States Commission, and I can tell you, we got the highest possible evaluations for our programs that I have known. In some of the pre-professional programs were reviewed by also other accreditors in addition to this national accreditation. So the National League of Nursing came to, to assess our nursing program. Our nursing program received the highest possible assessment and, and this is important, our Evelyn Spiro School of Nursing uh, was just awarded as a center of excellence in the United States. There are only 17 There are only 17 such. Think of all the thousand of nursing programs that exist, many attached to major research universities and hospitals and, and the like, only 16 others. And this nursing faculty does this in a building that was built originally as an, in 1956 as a men's dormitory built on the asylum model of architecture, I want you to know. <laughs> And in spite of that facility, they perform at a level, a standard of teaching and a standard of care far superior to the physical obstacles they face. They are remarkable. They truly are. Our education program also received an incredible assessment. The assessor there is the National Commission, Commission for the Assessment of Teacher Education Programs. A very, you can imagine in this day of monitoring uh, learning outcomes of students, looking at community involvement, the way in which you really are partnered with schools, measuring carefully the impact, particularly in a place like New York, the impact that you have learning on learning and the quality and professionalism of the teachers that you're producing. You can imagine the accent on that. We were visited after a two-year study, Dr. Stephen Preskill, uh, who was the chair at the time of the Education Department, now chaired by Karen DeMoss. So everyone gets nervous. They not only research fully your courses, fully your learning outcomes, <clears throat> the quality of your curriculum, the quality of your faculty. They interview extensively your teachers and your soon-to-be teachers, your undergraduate students and your graduate students. They interview schools that you're partnered with the student teaching occurs in the community, in this case mostly in Staten Island, uh, and so on and so forth. It's a very rigorous, there are seven standards, I believe. We, so we sat in the room when the visitors then read out their report. They had nothing to recommend. This is people who are supposed to come up with something, right? They had nothing. You are the gold standard of teacher education programs. You've built your... And as, Car as Karen DeMoss will tell you, Stephen before her and the members of that department, they're not just producing teachers, which would be a far, far, far wonderful thing to do. They are producing change agents and leaders for schools. And this is what uh, K through 12 education desperately needs. These are youngsters who come to Wagner and they learn what reflective practice really means. How to link theory and practice, classroom and field, text and experience intimately. And they have become really role models for much of the other faculty as well in terms of pedagogical issues and other issues. So those are just some of the assessments of the kind of learning outcomes that we have built. We've also re-enchanted our alumni to have pride again in Wagner College. They lost that for a long period of time. But they now have deep pride in what we do every day at Wagner. Not just because it's a bigger brand name where we have a great basketball team and a phenomenal theater program that you've seen tonight. 
but because they believe in the quality of teaching and learning that our faculty and students are engaged in and the kind of commitment we've made to civic engagement. And I'll, I'm going to explain why civic engagement is so important for our students. Because this college was founded in 1883 as a Lutheran seminary when five ministers got together to do something in support of immigrants in Rochester, New York with this seminary where they, where they were living. And they formed a seminary, a high school seminary. They thought the best thing they could come up with was to create more pastors to care for people. And think about 1883. It's the year the Brooklyn Bridge goes up, but it's also the industrial corridor from Syracuse across to Rochester and Buffalo all the way out to Cleveland and Detroit, uh, which was really the engine in post-Civil War period that fueled the kind of industrial base that established the United States as the uh, most uh, advanced economy in the world just a few generations later. So they wanted to care about them and they believed that you should lose knowledge for service to take care of other people, leave the world a better place. And Reverend Sutter brought us down as one of their graduates who became a minister and um, pastor of a very rural church in Staten Island, Trinity Lutheran Church. And he said, we should become a liberal arts college. There was no room uh, in Rochester to expand. They had no capability of expanding. I want to tell you, I went back to Rochester on the 125th anniversary to the site of where Wagner College was founded. It is now a gas station with the meanest dog that you ever want to see. So. <laughs> We're not going back to Rochester, even though we love Rochester. I lived close to Rochester at one time in my life. But we were brought, we, the notion that Reverend Sutter had, and we came down to a very rural Staten Island in 1918 and became a college in the 1920s and certified by the Regents as, a, as an undergraduate institution in 1929 and co-ed, by the way, in 1933, which was way ahead of its time in, in, in the Northeast. Uh, we came here because the charge was to become a National Liberal Arts College. The first lay president in 1935, Clarence Stoughton, believed that we should become a National Liberal Arts College, linking together knowledge and service of others. So this was a critical value. And for us at Wagner College now, all these years later, with pre-professional programs and liberal arts programs that are linked intimately together around our curriculum, where students learn to take the best of those worlds. That's why we call it the practical liberal arts, using your knowledge for social purpose. Our students are engaged in learning more about the disciplines they're involved in, while also engaged in good work with partners in our community on Staten Island and Brooklyn and throughout New York and around the globe, as I'll tell you in just a second or two. So that's become a marker of the way to learn, not just a civic value in and of itself, which would be remarkable, but also a a way of learning and learning how to use knowledge. So whether our students are going into business, 22% of our undergraduates major in business, which is the national average for undergraduates, we remind them that they're committed to investors and consumers and the general public as well. Or if in the arts, that they're committed to their audience and their texts. Or if they're in the helping professions, obviously with parents and students or patients and families. Or in any of the liberal arts in the, in, in the humanities, that there's a public or publics that count on them delivering what they do well with high integrity at high levels, but also in support of advancing human potential. So we've created that kind of an educational program that's civically bound. We've done lots of other things. We've helped restore, together as partners, we've helped restore some of the beauty of our campus where it was lost in Main Hall and a few other places and adding a new building. But that spectacular campus on the New York Harbor, and when you look at that harbor, you realize that the whole history history of American democracy, its incredible openness to commerce and innovation, its openness to diversity, and its willingness from its very start as a Dutch community to, to democracy and democratic participation was what founded this, this great city, and that's what we, we live that legacy every day. We prepare people for leadership in our communities and in their professions every day to live out that legacy which is written on that river. So we've, we've accomplished so much, but today higher education faces some very real hard choices. Some are really obvious in front of us. It costs too much money, affordability, maintaining access, and also accountability to make sure our students are really learning what we actually say they're going to 
to learn and able to achieve the kinds of values and skills that we say in our mission statement, proving that every day as I, as I indicated through some of our accreditors. That's the key mission, finding ways through increasing the productivity of the campus, through using new social media and technology, but always being a campus-based personal learning experience. Where, if not on a campus, do students learn how to negotiate diverse kinds of personalities, persons and ethnicities and races? Where else but on a college campus in the co-curricular program do students really learn about leadership? Where do they really have the opportunity to develop an international perspective, a respect for the arts, an understanding of the relationship of the scientific world and natural world to everything we do every day? These are things, where do they learn to be civically responsible, what it means to be an engaged student, and how leadership and service go together intimately in our country, unless we do that on a campus. So we are going to address issues of affordability, access, and accountability within the realm of what we do well, which is care about students deeply, provide them with a deep learning experience, and use the new technologies intelligently to enhance that program. But the other set of challenges we face, we face it as a nation, as a democratic nation, and we face it as a college that's committed to democratic education, prepare students for democracy and leadership. We face a challenge that the world now has two paths. One path affirms ignorance, hatred, intolerance, fanaticism, terrorism. That's a path. We see it every day. And no country and no culture holds a monopoly on that. There are no borders for that. That exists everywhere around us. And the other path is the path that celebrates reason and logic and evidence and perspective and empathy and compassion. It affirms life and affirms human possibility. So in this world that we're sending students out to, they need to understand their global perspective of how things fit together and how we use the liberal arts to liberate people from being simply prisoners of their own experiences, which is the hotbed for prejudice and the hotbed for hatred. Learning students learning how to be outside of their cultures, outside of their hot time periods historically, engaged in the world of science and the natural world around them, that liberates them. That's why it's called liberal arts. It liberates the person from being simply a prisoner, restricted to their own immediate experience, but learning deep and wide what it means to be cosmopolitan, to understand the cosmos around them. So that's important, and we are prepared to engage in that kind of learning as we now begin to link our courses with similar courses around the world. So students learn intimately together across time and space through the use of new technology. The way in we link communities together, the way we involve our students in the diverse communities of New York in this phenomenal partnership we have on Staten Island with Port Richmond, a historic community, the center of commerce at one point on Staten Island, which is now a community, an inner city community challenged in so many different ways, made up of 60% Latinos, mostly Mexicans, mostly undocumented, 20% uh, African Americans lost in the cycle of pathology of the inner city world with a lot of hopelessness, and, and about 20% of white ethnic New Yorkers from all sorts of places, middle class and working class. We've pledged ourselves to work with that community, linking our courses with the destiny of that community, learning, uh, teaching our students how they will increase their understanding of what it means about how to build a business plan, how to understand inventory and market analysis, and all the things you learn in a business, in a business uh, in curriculum, and help that community, with that community as true partners, be able to develop small businesses so that community can get a greater chance of having control of its own destiny. There are a lot of folks in that community who are dying to be part of the American dream and trying to be part of the New York idea. And so we are so committed to that. We're linking other students in that, to that community. That's a community, as you can think of all, uh, inner city communities, that has the scourge of diabetes and obesity everywhere, as people don't really know how to make sense out of nutrition. So we've linked our nursing courses, our physician assistant courses, many of the other courses in the languages, particularly Spanish, courses in political science and economics, and so on and so forth, to that community to be of assistance to really make a difference with them, partnered with them, having identified clear, measurable 
measurable objectives over a five year period to begin to reduce the incidence of diabetes and the incidence of, of diabetes. My students are learning what it means to be in a global community. Port Richmond is a global site in the world. It's made up of all kinds of people, as all of New York is, and therefore they're learning what it means to be global citizens right on our doorstep, as well as in places around the world that I'll tell you about in just a second. So we're committed, and we have really helped, in a sense, restore the good name of Wagner in Staten Island, on Staten Island. And I think Staten Island is very proud to have Wagner College as part of its hometown, and we are very proud of Staten Island. So we're trying to build a new building, a center for global learning, which we think will have the latest technology of ways of linking learners and teachers on campus, across campus, with our local community, and across the globe in any moment in time and space, preparing students to be the kind of civic leaders that we need. Because we need to graduate, and we are graduating students at Wagner who are prepared for, to face those two dilemmas, a world of ignorance and hate, or a world of human potential, prosperity, and innovation and justice and compassion. And that's what we do at Wagner. That's what we do every day. Let me tell you just a few stories before I leave. Let me tell you about Leslie McDermott, who graduated in 2007 in the nursing program, a very strong student in the liberal arts and in our nursing program. She works now here at, at New York Presbyterian Cornell Weill Center in the burn unit. She's won all kinds of awards from the fire department. She's only 26 years old. She's published as an author. She's going to be leading a wing of a hospital or a burn unit in some major institution somewhere in the world. She volunteers her time in Tanzania to work with burn victims in her free time there. But while at Wagner, she went to Kenya with Professor Snow and she began to work with AIDS orphans and understand a kind of a transformative experience, began to expand her understanding of what it means to really be a giving caretaker and a professional nurse and healthcare provider. Let me tell you about Tad Bender, who you met just earlier tonight, a young fellow, as, I, as, he, as he indicated, from New Hampshire, who used the Wagner plan so intelligently, created, was a kind of a shy kid when I first met him. And he came and he got actively involved on campus, formed lots of, of, of campus organizations, became the student government president, one of the most intelligent and, and, and erudite ones we've ever had, set a whole different standard for student government presidents since then. And he went on, he internship with Bob O'Brien and others at Credit Suisse, and now he's a rising, rising star, I think, in the world of finance. And he brings an incredible amount of personal integrity to everything he does, as well as very strong worth ethic. He learned that at Wagner, and he'll tell you that. And I can tell you about so many other students. I want to tell you about Jarell Joseph, who was a young African-American student who came to us to play football. We have a Division I athletic program. He came to us as a defensive back. He just had that leadership gene. He just needed honed and developed. He got active in all kinds of activities on campus in addition to athletics. He interned with Price Waterhouse Coopers. He's now one of the rising stars. He'll follow Jay Harding, who's one of the great alumni of Wagner College, who was a superstar in accounting and in the world of, of accounting and, and, and management. And I can only tell you how proud I am of, of Jarrell. I want to also tell you about Ashley Steed who came to us, graduated in 2009 with an undergraduate degree and 2010 with a master's degree. A young African-American woman. Her brother was killed. He graduated from Wagner as a great, great young man. as a football player. Uh, he worked in finance. And um, he was killed prematurely uh, in a car accident, just starting his career. And Ashley, his sister, was in high school. She received a scholarship to come to Wagner. At Wagner, she dedicated herself to really a, a level of grace and sophistication in learning as well as in the way she presents herself that was so remarkable. She helped start the Nubian Student Association and it became a force of great positive change on our campus. She volunteered with Habitat for Humanity, went down to New Orleans to help rebuild for, for after Katrina. She re helped work with Habitat for Humanity and rebuild, in building homes for afford, to make them affordable people in Brooklyn who couldn't have a decent place to live. She did adult uh, training for folks who are trying to get their GED degree. She's now a third grade teacher in Harlem, and she is a remarkable young woman, preparing other generations of kids who don't look like they have a chance to get a chance the way she did and really make a difference in the world. 
And there are other students I want to tell you about. I want to tell you about uh, Taylor Wheaton and, and Charles Nicholas. They were students in chemistry at Wagner. And Taylor particularly was very committed. She worked with Professor Muhammad Aloud and Professor Nick Richardson, who here's tonight, who mentored her in chemistry. She went to Bangladesh with Professor Aloud, and this was a moment of transformation. She not only was so taken aback by working in a culture different than her own, but she was there to help solve a problem, the practical liberal arts, to solve a problem of arsenic poisoning in the water supply. What things could they understand and come up with that were useful and practical for people? And they've made tremendous success on this, in addressing this problem in Bangladesh. She came back to Wagner, did lots of other volunteer work. Charles was heavily involved, excellent students, both of them. They ended up both being accepted to medical school at George Washington University. Our former, uh, our alum, Alan Goldstein, is here with his wonderful wife, Linda, tonight, graduated in 1959 from, from Wagner. He became the dean of the medical school at George Washington University. And here we had these two youngsters who got themselves into George Washington University, and they just now are starting their residency, having graduated from the medical school, taking their place in the medical professions, bringing the same core values that Wagner celebrated from 1883 to today. Leadership, service, achievement, that's everything we've been about. And they just got engaged. <laughs> Happily to each other. <laughs> I want to tell you about Mukhtar Jola. Mukhtar Jola grew up in Sierra Leone. Mukhtar only has one arm. He survived a horrible genocide in Sierra Leone. He saw his uncle and father killed in front of him. He had his arm hacked off because he could read and write, and the fanatics that were trying to take over his country wanted to destroy anybody who had the ability to read or write. He fled through the jungle, survived his wound somehow, was taken in by various shelter groups. To make a very long story short, he was brought as a contingent of, he was the, by far the oldest, of children from Sierra Leone to Staten Island by the very generous people on Staten Island. It's a very generous community. Tremendous number of civic organizations on Staten Island. Really very impressive. And the Rotary Clubs and Staten Island University Hospital uh, and a few other organizations as well it came together to say these poor children need prosthesis, they need surgeries, and we're going to house them. And Sue Lamberti's here tonight. She did a lot of this work uh, for, for, these, for these children. And so somehow we were approached at Wagner. I was the provost at the time. Um, and we were approached, could we find some way of supporting these kids in the off hours as they were waiting for surgeries and post-surgeries? Could they use the pool and this and that? Of course we did. In fact, our nursing program was the first program that stepped right up to do it. But other students did as well. And I got to know Mukhtar. He was the oldest one of them. And he knew a little bit of English, and he asked, could he take a course, a college course? He didn't want to give up learning. So I think he took a course with Professor Groth. I may have this wrong, but I know it was a psychology course. And uh, he struggled in English, but he sort of just was so persistent. So we turned around. Six months later, we said, we're going to give you a full scholarship to come to Wagner. He came to Wagner. He prospered. We offered him, after one year, a scholarship for his room and board. He said, I can't accept this. I said, why not? He said, I live in a house with three other genocide victims from Sierra Leone. I'm the only one with one workable hand. OK? So he went to Wagner. He graduated from Wagner. He now works in Brooklyn as a social worker in a hospital in Brooklyn. And his goal with his friend Sheku, who's now in our master's, our MBA program, getting a degree, an MBA with a specialization in um, healthcare administration, and his sister, who also came to Wagner, we sent for her, and she came from Sierra Leone. She has a nursing degree. They want to go back to Sierra Leone at one point and start a clinic. These are the kinds of graduates that we have at Wagner College. I have just a few more I want to tell you about. Because this is what we've done together. This is what we produce at Wagner College. We have with us in the audience uh, Katie Jo Youngkins, who's a young student who uh, went to Israel for a year. We started a program with Hebrew University and International Relations. But we said we're going to do it the Wagner way. Hebrew University didn't know what the heck we were talking about when we asked them to do this. but. They're the Harvard of Israel, so they were more focused on other things. I said, if our students go there, they have to do civic engagement work with some of the communities they're involved with. The wonderful Jewish Community Center, 
was the sister organization of a community just out of side of Jerusalem called Pisgat Zev. So Katie Jo and everyone who's gone to this program since worked with the community members of Pisgat Zev and teacher education, mentoring, all sorts of things that they needed and came back of course and then worked with the Jewish community. Katie, she's not Jewish by the way. And came back and worked with the Jewish Community Center here. She graduated last year. She's in her, master, her MBA program this year and she's applied for a Fulbright which I certainly hope she gets. And her goal is to study the, uh, the international financing structure for terrorism in the Middle East. These are the kind of people that we're graduating. I want to tell you just about two more. One is Samantha Siegel. I don't think in all of my years I've ever met students who rival the 1979 graduates, one of whom you met <laughs> from St. Lawrence. But Samantha Siegel's there. Samantha's here tonight somewhere. Don't leave this room without meeting her. She's here with her wonderful boyfriend, Chris Foreman, who's also a Wagner graduate and our golf coach as well as on our admissions team. So Samantha used every inch of the Wagner plan. Samantha Siegel came to us from New Jersey, wanted to be a teacher since she was a little kid. She came to, uh, I met her, she came to my house, we had an honors tea for honors freshmen. A, a bit of a spitfire. I said, there's something, there's something here. I mean, she can kind of rub you the wrong way when you first meet her. <laughs> But you know, this is Wagner and we're going to even this out. But there's an intelligence there and a fire that's really worth developing. So Samantha, uh, first of all, she fell in love with psychology under the tutelage of Amy Eshelman. Professor Eshelman is here. Dr. Larry Nolan. And uh, she just fell in love with psychology. But she also fell in love with education and teacher education. So what did she do? Three different terms, she went to Peru and worked with autistic children. All right? That's a struggle. Working with autistic children is a struggle. Working with them in another language is even more of a struggle. She's bilingual, but that is really a challenge in a different culture, three different times. She then went to Kenya to work with the AIDS orphans as well. Tremendous impact on her life. She, she double majored and did honors, psychology, teacher education. She student taught uh, in a school in, in Staten Island and got so attached to her students that when she was finishing her student teaching, she got a little weepy and she thought this is incredibly unprofessional and they shouldn't see her get so you know, emotional about leaving. And one of the students, actually a bunch of the students said to her, it's okay, Miss Siegel, you can come back and visit us. And then you don't have to teach us math either. <laughs> So Samantha graduated, she received her master's degree in education. She's going to, one of her dreams is to start her own charter school with these same values that I'm talking about somewhere in, in the United States. We also think she may become a college professor, but she will be leading something significant before her day is done. She is a remarkable young woman and just a tremendous leader. She's joined by Kevin Ferrara, who's at my table, who's a senior. This is one of the most remarkable young men I've ever worked with. He's a senior. These are two like deans I have on my campus who happen to be students. Um, Kevin has introduced us to the immigrant community uh, in Staten Island and Port Richmond. He really was the pioneer. He worked with El Centro de Migrante, which, is a, which started as a, a, an organization around justice for undocumented Mexicans who were being hired as day laborers and not paid, things like that. Taken to New Jersey to work on someone's garden, they would just dump them on the highway. and They have no documentation. They can't get caught by anybody. So he, that group started and he started working with them. He is also bilingual. He spent a year in Costa Rica before he came to Wagner. Uh, and uh, Kevin I had in, my, my, fr in, in our, my freshman seminar, I have an honor seminar I teach on Darwin, Marx, and Freud. It's very difficult. We read the original works. It's a pretty difficult seminar. And Kevin struggled with that seminar. He was very bright in seminar, but he had difficulty with some of his writing. He's gone on to be a brilliant student. I mean, a truly a brilliant student. But he got involved with this work. I think the work and civic engagement really turned him around. And he turned us around. And he really came a commitment to this one organization when he has this so much more than just stand for justice for undocumented workers. We're doing all kinds of mentoring and tutoring programs in that community. And he works closely with my, Professor Margarita Sanchez, who's here tonight from our Spanish department. 
he also, he, he hopes to go to graduate school next year and uh, study uh, in urban development to put a larger frame on it. And he will make a difference in cities uh, somewhere in the world. He's a remarkable young leader. And those two are leaving a cadre of young students, some of whom are here tonight, uh, training behind them other leaders who can take responsibility for some of these programs. Students like Molly Delbridge from Irvine, California, who's here. Morgan, Morgan Grubbs from North Carolina, who's a junior. Uh, uh, Jared Leff from Toms River, New Jersey. And Kelly Griffiths from uh, just outside the Hamptons in, um, in Long Island. Those four students are becoming the Samanthas and the Kevins of the next year. They're remarkable leaders. They're heading up each one of these initiatives in Port Richmond that I told you about. They're we're chairing each one initiative with a faculty member, a student, and a community member together. We've gotten great support from the foundations. All the bank foundations in Staten Line are supporting this program. And we're partnering with them and the hospitals in a major way. So that's what we do at Wagner. We produce students like this. This is what we've done together. We build buildings, we raise endowment, we give scholarships, we, give, you know, we get acknowledged by wonderful people who see the work. But what we do together is face off against the world that can be very dangerous, very mean-spirited, and very unjust. And we produce students in whatever their passions are, whatever their political ideology. I say at Wagner, we don't produce Democrats and Republicans, Libertarians, or Progressives. We produce leaders. They figure out what their values are politically. They do and take what they have and they use it because we believe that whatever profession they're going in, they've understood that there's a civic commitment. They understand that democratic societies need democratic cultures and that's what Benjamin Franklin understood and Thomas Jefferson understood when they formed the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Virginia. That to have an intelligent democratic society requires an educated citizen, an educated and engaged citizenry. And that's what we're doing at Wagner. It's been an absolute joy of my life, and Karen will tell you, to be part of these students' lives. And our collective legacy is written in their biographies, what they do with their lives. The twinning, the inter interrelating of these generations together here tonight is so central because together, your work, their work, their futures, your accomplishments are leading us to a much better place. And really, Wagner has become a beacon of light and hope in the world. Thank you so much for this evening. Richard, as you know, planning for this event has taken place over the past year and many joined in the effort. The enthusiasm brought to each meeting was palatable and tonight's extraordinary success is because of the love and respect of the folks have for you both. Thank you. The profits from this evening's festivities will go forward the funding of your dream of a cent for the Center for Global Learning. So there is no formal gift, but rather a naming opportunity down the road. <laughs> <laughs> However, you know the three girls who spearheaded the committees. We're not going to let you get away with that. <laughs> a naming opportunity down the road. Um, we felt you needed a memento of this wonderful evening. The hugs, the love, again, are palatable, but you deserve every one of them. Please enjoy this clock as it measures all the many hours you both put in to Wagner College to make us shine, and your dream for the Center for Global Learning. No matter how long it takes, that will measure the hours, and all of the bridges of New York are on the clock. You look at it every day, enjoy. I love you.
Beautifully done. For those of you, you know, Richard is always talking about bridges and how bridges connect us. Staten Island with Manhattan, but he uses it as a metaphor of bridges connecting us with one another. And they so cleverly have taken a variety of bridges, and, and I don't know how they did this, but it's around each of the sides of the clock. The New York City bridges. Very beautifully done. Thank you. We ask that you all stand. I don't know if you have any wine left or water left, but how about raising your glasses to the Thank first you. couple of Wagner Cup. Let me just say before you all leave, as Dick Hirsch taught me, my former president, any one of you could have your name on that building. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good night. Thank mm -hmm. you.